This is a 2003 Saline S7, and it's one of the few mid-engine supercars to come out of the United States. Saline is a company located here in California and best known for tuning Ford Mustangs, but in the early 2000s they decided they wanted to build a supercar of their own, and that's this, and it is insane. <laughs> I've borrowed this S7 from CNC Motors here in Southern California, which is an exotic car dealership that has everything. And I mean everything from Bugatti to Ferrari, Porsches, and vintage exotic cars. There's no end in sight. They have one of the most amazing showrooms of any car dealership on earth, and you can check them out if you click the links in the description below. And so it's no surprise that they have this. The Saline S7 made its debut way back in 2000. And at the time, it was basically the first mid-engine American-made supercar ever, unless you count Vector, which made cars in really small numbers. Not that the S7 is exactly common. This car was made through 2007, and Saline reportedly made only about 100 examples of this car, including both road cars and race cars. Not that there's much distinction, because the S7 basically is a race car, just with a VIN number and a license plate. The S7 uses a modified 7-liter Ford V8, and early S7 models like this one had 500 and 50 horsepower. That apparently wasn't enough for Saline because in 2005 they rolled out the S7 Twin Turbo with 750 horsepower. That car could supposedly reach almost 250 miles per hour. Now since this isn't the Twin Turbo, this car isn't quite that fast but the numbers are still amazing. Zero to 60 in 3.3 seconds, and Saline claimed this would hit a top speed of 220 miles an hour. Those figures are still tremendously impressive today, and they were really impressive almost 20 years ago when this car came out. But those numbers aren't my favorite little fact about the Saline S7. My favorite fact is that Saline claimed this car was so good at sticking to the road that if you got up to a certain speed, it generated more downforce than the car actually weighed, which means that theoretically you could drive it upside down if you reached a certain speed. I remember in high school when this car was out hearing that statistic and thinking that if I was really rich, like Bill Gates, I would build some loop track out in the desert and I would test that out. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen, but I'll settle for this. Today, I'm going to show you around the S7, and I'm going to show you all of the interesting quirks and cool features of one of the most amazing supercars that nobody really knows all that much about, and I'm going to give it a full review. And for more of my thoughts, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've also rounded up a list of the most expensive American cars currently listed for sale on Autotrader. Ah, the S7. I've always wanted to get up close with this car, and so it is time for quirks and features, starting with simply unlocking the doors. Unbelievably, this is the factory key fob that you get with the S7. It has four buttons on it, each of which are labeled one through four with Roman numerals for some reason. Now, to unlock the doors, you press button number one. Pretty simple. Button number two locks the doors. And then things get weird. Button number three unlocks only the driver's door. Button number four unlocks only the passenger door. So you can unlock the doors individually if you want. But it gets better. Once you've unlocked the doors individually, check this out. Press button three and you can open the driver's door with the push of a button. Looking all cool walking up to your saline as the door goes up automatically. Press button four and the same deal on the passenger side. The door opens automatically. It pops right up. And it gets stranger still, if you hold down buttons three and four together, it pops the trunk. And if you hold down buttons one and two together, it pops the front compartment. <laughs> so this car has a key fob, just like a normal car, but the functions of the key fob 
are anything but normal. And so we move on to the front compartment, which I will unlatch by holding down buttons one and two. It unlatches, then you go under here, and there is an actual release, and then it's open. And what you will find is that this is a little storage compartment. Not huge, but a storage compartment is always a welcome sight in a supercar. One rather interesting item about this particular storage compartment, the bottom of it is carbon fiber. The top of it is suede. Now, every other exotic car storage compartment I've ever been in has that reversed. The bottom is suede because that's where you put your stuff. And the top is carbon fiber because the panel itself is carbon fiber and exposed carbon looks cool. But not this car. In this car, they've flipped them. Now, next up, we move on to maybe the most characteristic detail of this car, and you can see it perfectly from that camera angle, the sheer number of vents or gills on the side of this car. Now, I counted. There are five separate locations on each side of the car where these gills exist. You have a group of them in front of the front wheels. You have a group of them above the front wheels. You have a group of them behind the front wheels. You have another group of them in front of the engine, and then you have a final group of them behind the engine on that body panel in back. There are five separate locations on both sides, 10 groups of gills on the side of the S7. Now I counted, there are 50 individual little gill openings on this car, 25 on each side, which sounds ridiculous, but I must admit, just looking at this car, it looks pretty cool. And those gills are part of what gives it the look of a car that seems to be going 200 miles an hour, even though it's just sitting still. One other interesting item on the outside, aside from all the gills, there are two functional air intakes. There's one right here on the front trunk, which looks fake, but actually it does go into some tubing inside the car. And then there's one over the top of the windshield, which carries back into the engine and brings air into the engine in back. Both of them also add to the cool look of this car. But not everything on the design of this car is cool or particularly special. And with that, I turn to the taillights. Now you glance at these taillights and you might think, I know those from somewhere. Yes, you do. The Lamborghini Diablo used these same taillights. So did the early Pagani Zonda. So did the Spiker C8. And so did the SSC Ultimate Aero. And so do a lot of buses and trucks. These lights are just made by a supplier and they're generic and they fit a lot of government requirements. So automakers that don't necessarily have the money to develop their own lights and get those through all the regulations can just go and pick up these. And so several supercars and old school trucks share these taillights. Interestingly though, although some of the automakers that used these taillights integrated reverse lights into them, Celine, for whatever reason, decided not to do that. Instead, the reverse lights on the S7 are down here in this kind of odd spot above the license plate. There are two of them right next to each other, and like in every other car, they turn white when you put the S7 in reverse. Now, next we move on to the trunk, which I have already unlatched by pressing the three and four buttons on the key fob together. Once you've done that, you open it up and you will see that, well, it's a trunk, which is a neat trick because I already showed you this car's trunk. It has two trunks, which makes it relatively practical, although that's not exactly a word I would use to describe this car, but at least in this case, it's true. Now, when you get back here, you'll notice a couple of interesting items. One is the fact that once again, you have carbon fiber on the bottom and suede on the top. So you put your item that you want to carry in the trunk on the carbon fiber, not on the suede, which is an odd decision, but apparently that's one they're committed to. Now, in the trunk, you will also notice the battery. That is not the factory battery location, as you might imagine, based on the fact that there is a hole going from the battery into the engine. But the factory battery location, I am told, you have to remove a wheel just to get to the battery, which is obviously incredibly annoying. And so this car, at some point, they probably relocated the battery to make it easier to access, so you don't have to do that whole thing. You can also see this yellow cord stuck onto the battery. That's the battery tender to leave the battery charging if the car sits for a while. None of that stuff, however, is the most interesting thing about the rear trunk. The most interesting thing is the fact that there there is an emergency trunk release latch. So if you get stuck in here, you can open it and then pull it out in case someone tries to kidnap you in their Saline S7. The problem? The emergency release latch is inside the engine compartment, which is not accessible from the trunk. You can see that latch has a picture of a trunk opening and a guy running away. 
but it's not actually in the trunk where you could access it if you get caught in the trunk. Now, I assume the reason this is going on is because Celine wanted a secondary manual release for the trunk beyond just the electronic release on the key fob. So they figured, hey, you know, there is a manual release that already basically does what we want it to. Even though it's supposed to go inside the trunk, we'll just repurpose it and put it somewhere else so there is a manual way to open the trunk. And so they just went with those latches, even though that's not specifically what they were designed to do. Now, two other interesting items with the trunk back here. One is the fact that, as you can see, when you put the trunk up, it actually bisects the spoiler. There are extra pieces of spoiler above the taillights that stay put, and then you have the one piece on the trunk that goes up with the trunk. It's odd. In a lot of cars that have a similar situation, they just have the whole spoiler go up with the trunk, but in this car, they made the spoiler in three distinct pieces, which is rather unusual. Another interesting item around back is the fact that this car has a backup camera. It's right here above the saline font. You have this little circular camera placed in here, very small, but it has one. That would have been a big deal back in 2000 when this car first came out. Basically nothing had a backup camera back then, but this car was supposed to be cool and modern and futuristic, and so it has one. And next up, we move on to the engine, and there you see it. That's Ford's seven liter V8 with 550 horsepower, absolutely massive. And then on the twin turbo models, they strap two turbochargers on it for 750 horsepower, just totally crazy. This is obviously a really impressive thing to see, especially today. The days of these giant engine manual transmission supercars are pretty much over. Now, one thing I like back here, obviously the cover over the engine is glass, like it was in a lot of supercars from this era and still today. But I like the fact that there are also two side windows back here that also allow you to look into the engine bay, but just from a different perspective. Indeed, on the Celine S7, there are just as many windows that look into the engine compartment as you can look out of from the passenger compartment. Now, next up, we move on to getting into to the Saline S7, where there are a couple of interesting items. One is the fact that there is a rather large exposed keyhole right here on the door, but as you can see, there's no door handle. So how do you get into this thing? Well, underneath this line, there is a little silver circular button. You push it, and then it releases the door, which goes up in this very cool manner, precisely befitting the supercar that this vehicle is. Now, once the door is up, you can see that one crazy thing about this car is just how wide this door sill is. It's like two feet of door sill. Obviously, that's because all the structure of the car is placed in here, and they wanted this thing to be as tight and as rigid as possible, and that's why you have this massive door sill that you have to climb over when you're entering the S7. Next up, one other item in the door sill of the S7 before we move into the interior. Now, right here, you can see there's this latch, which is pretty standard, the door latch, and next to it, there's this silver circular thing. So what exactly is that? Well, that's another emergency entrance into the trunk. If you pull it, it'll pop the trunk, and there's one in front as well next to the front door hinge. If you pull that circle, it'll pop open the front hood, and you can gain access just in case you can't get in any other way. Now, once you get into the S7, and you can see that it's rather tight in here, <laughs> There are several interesting quirks and features, as you might expect, starting with the parking brake. The parking brake is located to the left of the driver's seat, between the driver's seat and the door sill, which is common in older supercars, but not all that common today. You also have, right next to the parking brake, a little storage area, once again, finished in suede, so whatever you're storing in there doesn't fly out. Now, next to the storage compartment over there, you have two buttons. One is for the trunk release, and the other is for the engine compartment release, both in the back. Now, I already showed you that you can do that with the key fob, but obviously if you're driving the car, if you're in the interior, it's easier to just push a button rather than get your key fob. And so those buttons release those two items. Now, the next interesting item is the seat itself, and namely the fact that it's fixed in place. There are no seat rails. You can't move the seat forward or backwards. Just like in a race car, the seat is fixed in place. You can move the steering wheel up or down, but the seat itself doesn't move. This is one of those cars where when you buy it, you're supposed to go to the factory and they measure you, and then they sort of reconfigure the interior of the car around your size. And so if you don't fit in one of these, you actually have to get a technician out here to move the seat into a different position. You can't just pull a latch 
and move the seat back. Now, if you're wondering why that is, I guess the three there is weight savings. It's one less thing you gotta put in the car. It saves a little bit of weight. But to me, it's just crazy not to have a movable seat in an automobile. Nonetheless, that's the situation with the S7. Another interesting item in the S7, something I always found absolutely ridiculous with this car, is the fact that the turn signal stock is just out of the Ford parts bin. It's right from the Focus. And same with the windshield wiper stock, just out of a Focus or a Taurus or whatever Ford was making in those days. Now, switch gear is expensive to produce, and that's why smaller volume automakers go to bigger volume automakers to get switch gear like Tesla went to Mercedes-Benz. But despite that, I always made fun of the Celine S7, this crazy expensive supercar for having Ford Focus turn signals until I got my Ford GT. <laughs> It also has Ford Focus turn signals. Needless to say, I don't make fun of this car anymore. Now, next we move on to the steering wheel, which really looks like the steering wheel that you would expect to find in a race car. And you will see that there's no airbag in there, which is a surprise because in the United States, all cars are mandated to have airbags, and they have been since 1998. And this is later than that. But Celine was able to negotiate a small volume automaker exemption to the airbag regulation, arguing that it would be costly to put it in this car, and it's not dramatic risky anyway since they're gonna make so few of these and so they were exempted from the airbag requirement both for driver and passenger with that said the steering wheel does have one normal component you'd expect the horn right in the middle you have the saline logo you push it and you hear this car's horn and if you've ever wanted to know what the horn sounds like in a saline s7 well here you go Now, next we move on to the gauges, where you won't find anything particularly interesting. The tachometer is in the middle, like it is for a lot of sports cars. You have the speedometer on the left, it goes up to 240. My favorite, though, is over on the right, you have the fuel gauge and the engine temperature. Not all that surprising, but I like the fact that they've printed in there premium fuel. A lot of times, automakers will print that on the gas tank, but not saline. They have that in the actual fuel gauge, premium fuel. There's also a little direction indicator in there where the fuel door is. In my car, it just has a picture of a gas tank and then an arrow, but in this car, it literally says fuel door with an arrow. I guess they figured people were not smart enough to figure out the more subtle directions. Next up, moving on to turning on the S7. Just like in most cars, a little ignition tumbler to the right of the steering wheel. You put the key in, you twist it, and then it's on, except it isn't. You actually have to go through one more step. To the left of the steering wheel, there's a button marked engine start. You push that, and that is what actually fires up the engine. And with that in mind, let's take a listen to a couple of revs from the Saline S7. <laughs> Now, next up, moving on to the center console in this car, there are a couple of other interesting items in here. One is the center storage compartments, the thing the furthest back. It is hinged towards the driver, so the passenger can't really access it, but the driver can, and inside of it, you will find the remote. This car has a remote because it came standard from the factory with this little Kenwood display. <laughs> Saline didn't have the money to develop its own proprietary Saline radio display, and so instead you have the Kenwood one. But the benefit of that was it allowed Saline to have that backup camera since they could wire it through the Kenwood system. It looks aftermarket, but actually it isn't. Now, other interesting items in the middle, you will see directly in front of that storage compartment, you have a little button for the hazard lights. Push that and they go on, pretty simple. Above that, you have the window switches left and right, and then a button marked U and L. What is that? That's a lock button. Unlock and lock. Now, why didn't they just use a picture of a lock and a picture of an unlocked lock like every other car? We may never know. That story may be lost to time. Why Celine decided U and L was preferable to little pictures. Now, above that on the left, you have the mirror control, pretty standard, and then you have a couple of the climate controls. The rest of the climate controls are in the center, and they're pretty normal. You have the one on the left changes the airflow, the one in the middle changes the temperature, and the one on the right changes where the air is coming out. None of that stuff is very strange, but there is one strange item with the climate controls, and that's the fact that this car only has two cabin climate vents. They're these two directly in the middle 
middle underneath the climate controls, and that's it. Apparently, Celine didn't want to put the tubing to climate vents over on the sides of the passenger compartment, so you only have those two tiny little climate vents in the middle. That's all you get. Now, the next interesting item in this car is the footwells which are just crazy. The reason I'm sitting like this is because even though I have enough room and even enough headroom by far, I don't have enough room for my feet because of how ridiculously offset the footwells are. When you climb into this car, you have a normal amount of room for seat width, but then as it goes forward, it basically becomes like a little point for the footwells where you can actually stick your feet. They are incredibly, ridiculously small. I've never seen anything like it. And to illustrate just how narrow they get, take a look at the floor mat when it's out of the car. You can see it starts off normal and then it just gets narrower and narrower as it goes into the footwell. Absolutely ridiculous. And it makes sitting in this car, even as a passenger, relatively uncomfortable. And by the way, the offset footwell thing is especially crazy because of the pedals. If you look over on the driver's side, you can see that the footwell comes to that point and that means that the pedals are basically on the right side of the footwell so in your car you're used to just driving along and pressing the pedals and having your legs straight in this car you basically sit down and then kind of twist your legs to the right so you can reach the pedals it's crazy two other interesting items things this car doesn't have one is a glove box no glove box in the saline s7 although that's not really a surprise a lot of cars like this don't have a glove box and remember they did include two trunks just for you to put stuff in. One other thing this car doesn't have is an interior rear view mirror. There's not one up there, and it's not like it was yanked out. I don't see a space where it would have been or any gunk on the windshield from where it would have stuck on, so maybe it didn't have one. Now, interestingly, the owner's manual describes an interior rear view mirror, but maybe it was an option and not everybody got it. With that said, there are mirrors on the sun visors. You drop them down and you can see there are mirrors on passenger and driver side. So when you're driving around in your S7, you can look at yourself. Finally, we move on to one surprising item I wasn't expecting to find in this car, and that would be the owner's manual. Now the owner's manual in this car is very straightforward and simple. Then again, it has to be. They've summed up everything in like 50 pages or less. The thing that I find especially funny about the owner's manual is though, it's largely just a picture book with images of the S7. Like 40% of the owner's manual just has these glossy pictures of the S7 repeatedly throughout it. But there are a couple of interesting items in here where it explains how to do stuff. And on the first page, there's a nice little note from Steve Saline, the founder of the company, telling you to enjoy your S7. Seven. Now, next, since I'm in this vicinity, I want to talk about the fuel door, which is quite a bit more unusual than the fuel door you'll get in basically any other vehicle. So to start the process of opening it, you can see they've printed the words lift open on the outside of the fuel door. You lift open that little cover and you will find a keyhole. Now, each S7 was delivered with two keys, a short key and a long key. The short key goes into this little keyhole in the fuel door and then it opens it up. You twist the key and then the fuel door opens. Now one interesting item with the keys, you can't take the key out of the fuel door until you've closed it back up again and locked it, which is kind of annoying because it means that when you pull the fuel door down, you have no choice but to kind of let the key dangle on the paint. You have to be very careful with it. But anyway, when you're done filling up your S7 with fuel, you then have to push the fuel door back up until you hear a click. And then you can twist the key, lock it and pull the key out. You push the cover over it again, and the fuel door is complete. And so those are the quirks and features of the Saline S7. And now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. Except it isn't because I don't fit in this car. And because I know you people love to see this, here is a little compilation of me attempting. Interestingly, the problem is not the really narrow pedal box. Someone suggested I take off my shoes and I could get my feet in there. The problem is more just the fact that the seat is 
too far forward. Like I mentioned, you buy this car and then they take it back to the factory and tailor it to your size. The previous owner must have been smaller and so he had the seat move forward so he fit, but I don't. I can't actually get my legs in there and get my butt in the seat in order to drive this car. Now, this has never happened before in five years of filming these videos. I fit in the BMW Isetta. I fit in the Alfa Romeo 4C. I drove a Lotus Elise across the country from California to Georgia years ago before I ever even started doing YouTube stuff and I fit in that car too. I fit in the back seat of basically everything. Countless 911s, the Nissan GTR, the Ferrari California T and the Portofino, even the Kuvale Mangusta everything, and yet I can't get in the Saline S7. Interestingly, the seat clearly has a couple extra inches where it could go back, and then I could get in. The headroom is fine, the legroom seems to be okay, it's just the fact that it's simply too far forward. And so that's all we got with the Saline S7. Now, back when this car was new, the original price was something like $400,000. The twin turbo ones were like $600,000. It was totally crazy. But if you took a look at the numbers and the top speed this car could hit, it made some sense. And this is probably one of the most forgotten $400,000 supercars in existence. With that said, Celine claims they're gonna be coming out with a more modern version of this car, an updated version they're gonna bring back and sell as a new car again. And if that happens, I can't wait to test it out and to drive it, assuming I fit. If not, a shorter YouTuber <laughs> will have to do the work for me. But for now, this is as good as it gets.